Welcome into the install with Greg Cosell of NFL Films. I'm your host, Buck Rising. This is the man himself, Greg Cosell. A little bit of different scenery for me today, Greg. I'm a little backlit, but I think it's I think it's kind of nice to be outside. Is it hot? Oh, my God. It's 110 heat index. It's miserable. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I hope I can't. I hope the people on camera, I'm a little I'm a little backlit, so I'm a little darker. So you can't see necessarily the sweat just rolling off me. But yeah, it's uh, it was a brutal, a brutal day out there for the for the Bucks and the Titans who were holding joint training camp practices. But it was fun watch. I don't know how those guys do it. I mean, when I go to, you know, go to, let's say, Eagles training camp and it's hot, I'm, I'm struggling after a half hour. I don't know how these guys do it. No. Uh, well, Kevin Byard, Kevin Byard looked like he'd just come out the shower when he came over to have a press conference. Right, 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 right. Just absolutely. I don't know how they keep the weight on this time of year, but certainly uh, certainly the football on the field was really, really enjoyable. So on today's episode, coming off the preseason, we know that Greg watches guys specifically during the preseason as opposed to, you know, grand sweeping schematic right. preseason takeaways because <laughs> none such thing exists. So we'll talk about Dylan Radens and Rashad Weaver of the Titans towards the end of the podcast. But Greg, I wanted to start with these five first round quarterbacks that the Titans may, may see all five at some point throughout the course of the season because all five of those teams are on their schedule so I guess for the audience kind of walk people through how you go about your quarterback evaluation coming out of college yeah I, you know quarterback evaluation is is interesting and obviously sitting here in my office at NFL films and not getting an opportunity to, to necessarily know the quarterbacks personally and sit down and have meetings with them as teams do that part of it is out of the equation for me so I can't do that and and very often that's absolutely critical, Buck, as you know. Yeah. So uh, very often you can watch a player on tape, either like or dislike what you see, then meet them, get a chance to talk with them, and you feel, I don't want to say totally differently, but something either clicks in a positive way or a negative way, depending on the case, and it can really help you in your evaluation of a player. So all I can do is speak to the approach with tape. And we have to start with this idea. We're so used now to seeing quarterbacks run around and make plays. Think of the Patrick Mahomes. Think of a Russell Wilson. But that's not the way the position is taught, Buck. So you have to start with the idea that quarterback is a nuanced, detailed, disciplined craft position. That starts with taking the snap. That starts with your drop back and your footwork on your drop. That continues with how you plant your back foot when you get to your your plant point in the drop how do you hold the ball what they call ball carriage do you hold it too high do you hold it too low all these things factor in to how you evaluate a quarterback and ultimately whether they're going to be successful snap after snap after snap we're used to seeing the great plays the spectacular plays but as you know Coaches don't roll the ball out and say, let's run around today and make some plays. That's not the way the position is taught. That's not the way the passing game is taught. So what always has to sync up when you watch quarterbacks is what always has to sync up is the depth of the drop, whether it's a three-step timing drop, a five-step timing drop, or a seven-step timing drop, that has to sync up with the depth of the routes. Because otherwise, the quarterback might be ready to throw and receivers are still running routes. Or the quarterback or the receivers could have finished their route based on the route concepts and the quarterback is still moving and he's not in position to throw. So all these things factor into how you go about evaluating a quarterback. And because I've done this for a long time, when I watch college quarterbacks, I'm able to see what the route concepts are. Uh, in college, it's a little different. Not that the route concepts are necessarily different because there's not a thousand route concepts, but in college, because of the hash marks, the wide side of the field is much wider than it is in the NFL. And there's right. a lot more space. So very often you could make quicker throws because the receiver can just run to an open spot. And those are easy throws. And you in some ways have to discount those throws when you evaluate a quarterback. I was fortunate enough to speak with a coach this summer who said something very interesting to me, which I have always agreed with, but he really kind of the way he said it resonated. And he said that when he evaluates college quarterbacks, 
he can do away with a lot of the plays because a lot of the plays are those quick throws I spoke about to a wide open receiver. They're bubble screens. They're the kinds of throws that don't necessarily indicate whether a quarterback can transition well to the league. And what he said to me was, he said, how does a quarterback operate when he's under duress? Because in the NFL, you're going to be under duress. And you don't want to just see the quarterback flee the pocket. You want to see the quarterback be able to handle the structure of the offense, the timing of the offense, the rhythm of the offense when there are people around him. Because in the NFL, there will be people around the quarterback and you can't simply break down and start running around. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, such a, it's such a better way to kind of run it through that prism, I guess. And, and certainly with the context of the hash marks for the wide receivers and how much more space there that is in college, because then it, then you start to look at it more like these coaches do rather than just being, you know, thrilled by the number, by the statistics and the, and the highlight plays that these guys are putting up. So five first round quarterbacks this year in the draft, Trevor Lawrence, I, I guess, Greg, and you know, I, I ask only out of necessity sure. was Trevor Lawrence, your top evaluated prospect out of this class. Cause I know, you know, he had been the second coming basically right. since coming out of uh, high school yeah. in Georgia. Was that the and case I, for you? No, no, he, he wasn't the second coming. I think he's a good prospect. He's big. He throws the ball. Well, um, you know, you speak about playing under pressure. He was rarely under pressure this year uh, at Clemson. When you look at his tape and, and I was speaking to someone about this, they said that, uh, and this is by NFL standards of pressure. Yeah. Um, that he was only under pressure on 34 of his dropbacks. Think about that for a second. Bob. That's crazy. That is, that is such a ridiculously small number. So, so Lawrence clearly has traits to be a successful quarterback. But if you go back to some critical games in his career, particularly his sophomore season and this past year, his junior season, his last one at Clemson, when he got to the playoffs and he started to face a little bit of pressure, particularly pressure up the middle, because he's a little bit of a body thrower, in other words, he's a strider, not with a big windup, but a little bit of a windup. He, he's not what you'd call compact, like you think of compact throwers. Yeah. So what happens is if he feels some pressure in front of him, he rushes his delivery a little bit because he knows he knows how he throws it. You, we all know if you've played sports, you kind of know what you can and can't do. And so he sometimes has a tendency in the face of, of pressure that's coming from right in front of him to speed up his delivery. And at times that would cause him to be a little scatter shot high. So that's one thing that the tape showed when you really broke it down in detail. And that's, I don't want to say that's a concern as if he can't make it in the league, but that's something that needs to be worked on because what will happen in this league is when you get into the regular season games is teams will pressure him and they'll focus their pressure up the middle. They'll do that any number of ways, whether they add rushers via blitz, whether there's stunts where uh, they attack from the inside, but they will pressure him up the middle and force him to have to execute with people in his face. Well, and that, that ridiculous stat being pressured on only 34 of his dropbacks that, that gives so much, that, that makes me understand better what I watched against the Browns in his preseason game because he held onto the ball too long. He took two pretty ugly sacks, uh, fumbled on one of them. And, he, there, he, of course, he showed some good things as well, but that puts it in a whole different light. I guess what was your evaluation of Trevor Lawrence in this first NFL, you know, pseudo NFL action, we'll yeah. call it, understanding that it's a preseason match. And, and I think that, you know, the, the first sack came on his first drop back, and that was a classic case which is totally expected with a young quarterback, his read was to the left side of the offensive formation. It was a two by two set, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And Marvin Jones was the slot receiver and LaVisca Chenault was on the outside. And he dropped back with his eyes on Jones in the slot and Jones was covered, but he stayed on Jones too long. And he did have Chenault on the inbreaker to the read side, the same side as Jones. So when I said it's common for young quarterbacks, he was slow to eliminate what was not there and to isolate what was there. And that's very common for young quarterbacks. You'll see that with quarterbacks in their third, fourth, fifth year. And so that sack was on him because he did have a throw to the Reed side. Yeah. 
I, I, I really, I, I enjoyed watching him and, and, you know, seeing him under pressure and kind of working through, you know, NFL, not, not progressions. How did, how did we qualify it the last time we talked the not process of elimination, but basically for a quarterback working through his reads in that way, it was good to see him function from a mechanical standpoint. Yeah. And the term I use everybody, you know, a lot of people use the word processing. I, I like to use the phrase eliminate and isolate as yes. I just did, where you eliminate what's not there and isolate what is there within the timing and structure of the play design. Because that's ultimately what you're trying to do. As you gain more experience, if you're going to become a really high level player, and obviously that's what the Jaguars hope with Lawrence, those, the really good ones do it a very high percentage of the time before the ball's even snap buck. I mean, the Tom Brady's of the world, he's just doing a quick validation after he gets the snap. He's all, he already knows where he's going with the football. It was crazy to watch him again out here today, Greg, just speaking of Brady, because the tempo that he runs these 11 on 11s and seven on sevens, one on ones, he's, he's, he is, he's already knows where he's going with the football to your point. And it shows, and it had the Titans defensive backs on their, on their heels for an er, for a good portion of the early part of these yeah, joint training and, camp practices together. And it's one reason why you very often see, um, and, and someone like Dean Pease, who, you know, obviously from his time in Tennessee, now yeah, in Atlanta, yeah. With Arthur Smith, he, he's a master at this. It's why you see defensive coordinators, particularly with younger quarterbacks, show a lot of disguise and late movement right at the snap of the ball with their defensive players, because a quarterback comes, a young quarterback comes to the line of scrimmage, and he's just trying to make sure he got the play call and everybody's all where they're supposed to be, and then all of a sudden he takes the snap and the defense moves. <laughs> yeah. They're not where he, they were before the ball was snapped. And now all of a sudden he feels that time pressure, that time clock, because that goes down real fast. You only get two to three seconds to begin with. And all of a sudden, if there's uncertainty as your in your mind as to what you're seeing, you're done. Then, then, then you're just seeing people. You're not, you're not defining the people, but you're just seeing people. Right. And it's very hard to play quarterback that way. Well, and Sam Darnold on the sidelines a couple of years ago talking about seeing ghosts, that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, and you know what? He's not the only one. I mean, obviously that got a lot of play, but he's certainly not the only one. A lot of young quarterbacks see that. And, and you know, talking about the college game versus the NFL game, because of the, the hash marks, very often when college quarterbacks get to the NFL, and I had this conversation with, with some a number of years ago, the college game – is very often played outside because there's so much space outside the NFL game is played much more inside. You have to make throws between the numbers, between the hashes. And very often college quarterbacks coming into the league will say, Oh my God, it looks like there's 15 defenders out there because they've got to throw the ball in the middle of the field. And there's a lot of people there. Yeah. So going off that conversation, just kind of tangentially about Brady. Now, Mac Jones is not necessarily the successor to Tom Brady, but a lot of comparisons are obviously being made. And it's somebody who uh, I'm sure that Bill Belichick got the stamp of approval from Nick Saban and Josh McDaniels that he was going to be able to efficiently run their offense. And a a, a preseason version of the offense is what we obviously saw. Mac Jones, not overwhelmingly athletic, but he was hugely efficient in the t- in the action that he did see in that preseason game. Greg, what was your uh, what did you make of Mac Jones? Yeah, they didn't ask him to do very much, Buck. So they right. gave him a lot of quick game, what we call bang play action, wide receiver screens, basic reads like slant flat. Um, they did give him no huddle to start the third quarter possession with snaps of empty. That's something obviously Brady's done throughout his career. Um, Mac Jones is an interesting guy because he's not big. He's not physical. He does not have a big arm. Um, he is really going to have to master the, the nuances of the quarterback position. He's going to have to be an elite decision maker. He's going to have to be elite before the ball snapped. He's going to have to be elite when it comes to recognition of pressures and coverages. Um, and, and I'm not saying he can't be. You know, I think from I, I never met Mac Jones, but from what I understand, he picks things up well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's what he's going to have to be in order to be a higher level quarterback. Now, in this particular game, uh, the first preseason game against Washington, he certainly showed the ability to function effectively within the structure of the pass game. 
but he must see things a little quicker and play a little faster mentally. And again, that's to be expected. It's his first NFL action. And I don't care where he came from the SEC. This is the NFL. So again, again, it's, it was his first action. He'll probably pick that up as he goes along, but he'll, he'll need to be a little quicker and a little faster mentally. Uh, from from Mac Jones to Zach Wilson, you know, you, you you can't obviously evaluate a player, but just by looking at the stat line. But Mac, I mean, Zach Wilson's stat line is it was nothing that would blow you away. But you watch some of the plays that he made, particularly on third downs in that game for the Jets, Greg, and and you you really saw the kind of traits and athletic ability and accuracy down the field that has had the scouts all fired up about him, and obviously had him go second overall. How what did you make of? of Zach, uh, Zach Wilson in his first preseason action uh, with a new team and a new set of skill position players. Yeah, I think he threw nine balls, but I think you saw, you know, it's funny. Uh, when a quarterback does what you saw him do in college, uh, you know, I, that's not something I get excited about. We'll get to right. Justin Fields in a minute, but Justin Fields moved around and people are acting like, oh my God, he's mobile. Well, yeah, <laughs> we, we know he's mobile. Sure he is. You know, yeah. Whereas Zach Wilson, you saw the, the quick light feet, which you saw in college. They'll, they'll use the play action boot game with him because he's in that style of offense. That's going to be a 49ers style of offense where play action boot is a staple of that offense. And he's got light, quick feet. He's got a live, loose arm that showed up. He's got an easy delivery, good velocity. Um, so you saw all that in his nine, I don't know if he was sacked, but I know he threw nine balls. So you saw that on tape. Um, so beyond that, there's not much more to say, but he showed the feet and the arm that you saw when you watched his, his BYU tape. Yeah. Six, six of nine, 63 yards did not take a sack in that game, but you definitely saw the the kind of traits that had scouts drooling over him. So let's talk about Justin Fields because the Bears fans are crazy. The Bears fans are out of their mind, Greg. You know this. They they they, they yeah. so desperately want a quarterback. They haven't had a quarterback since Jim McMahon and really even then Sid Luckman. So we're talking about a long, long drought of quarterback prowess in Chicago for a fan base that is hungry for it. They were just happy that he looked cool in their uniform based on the reaction <laughs> I saw on Twitter after the preseason game. But the conversation, of course, leading into the draft was, well, why is Justin Fields not being discussed in the same kind of conversation as Zach Wilson or even Trey Lance with the 49ers, who we'll get to later on? What is it that sets Justin Fields apart from the rest of these guys? Well, Justin Fields is a very, very talented guy because he's big and he's athletic and you don't realize how big he is. He's big. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think what you saw with him in this first action was relatively positive. First of all, he looked very poised. Um, and, and I think that's really important. Um, he just looked composed. It looked like he belonged on the field. He, uh, and especially on the move, he looked very, very comfortable. I thought his best throw was an incompletion. It was a sail route where the coverage was really, really good. But he just laid the ball out with, with pace and touch. Uh, and it just was incomplete because of the coverage, not because of the throw. Um, and actually, he played against the Miami Dolphins. And they did show him a pretty good mix of man coverage, including what we call one robber. They played zone coverage. They played cover two. Um, so he saw some things. I thought he showed some subtle pocket movement. He obviously showed the ability to get out on the edge, both by design and uh, second reaction movement. So you saw what he could become. Uh, and I think it, it was it was a positive performance. There's a stark difference, obviously, in that quarterback room from Andy Dalton to Justin Fields and then Nick Foles, who, you know, what, whatever Nick Foles it is right. at this point in his career, he is not Justin Fields. Um, so I guess what what about Nagy, Matt Nagy's offense can can allow Justin Fields to succeed at a high level, understanding that they're probably going to go with the veteran Dalton out of the gate, whether, you know, that's what the fan base wants or not. Well, we don't know that. I mean, obviously, but. You know, don't forget Matt Nagy comes from the Andy Reid school. That's yeah. how he was brought up in the game as a coach. So much of what he does comes from that conceptually. Um, you know, keep in mind, what was it? Was it three years ago when 
what whatever Nagy's first year was as a coach, and Trubisky had the good year, and people were talking about, wow, you know, this is a really good marriage, Matt Nagy and 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 uh, Mitchell Trubisky, because Trubisky looked pretty comfortable within the context of that offense in that season. So this is a perfectly fine offense. It has very good route concepts. Um, you know, Fields should be able to be effective, and then you've got the movement ability. Yeah. You know, I'm not suggesting that he's Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes is is truly special in certain things he can do. I'm not quite ready to say Justin Fields is that guy, but think of Mahomes in the Chiefs offense, and then think of Fields in a very similar style offense, and I think Fields will be a successful player. Yeah, to 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 the greatest of the unknowns, then in Trey Lance at this point understanding that tape is the way that you evaluate and right. tape from 20 or 2020 was non-existent nearly for Trey Lance, as it was for Dylan Radins coming out of North Dakota state, who we'll talk about here in just a minute, but Trey Lance. And I mean, the 80 yard pass is, is the, is the candy. That's the eye candy. That's what everybody gravitate towards. What, what did you see from him operationally and what makes Trey Lance the kind of player that had everybody talking despite there being this lack, this lack of body of work, really. Right. Well, it's funny you mentioned the 80 order because that's one of their kind of staple big play concepts for people who actually follow the Niners. Um, Garoppolo hit George Kittle in 2019 against the Green Bay Packers on the exact same play call in, in, in a regular season game. And even Matt LaFleur, who comes from the Niner lineage with Shanahan, there was a touchdown last year from Aaron Rodgers to Robert Tunyon, which was the exact same play call. So that was a staple play call. It was there. He made a great throw. Um, but overall, Lance struggled a bit. Um, right. He was a little hesitant and he hurried his mechanics when he was. He played a little fast when he had to come off his primary. Um, he needs some work on those pace and touch throws. In this game, he was a little too much of a fastball pitcher. Um, and I think just he needs to become a little more settled in the pocket with his feet. So it was an uneven first game. But again, you have to remember, he really hasn't played football in two years. Right. He played one game last year, which had much more of a scrimmage feel to it because I watched it. He wasn't very good in that game, which didn't surprise me, but the game had a scrimmage feel to it. So he hasn't played a lot of football. So, you know, it's very difficult to make any kind of judgment, any meaningful judgment um, as to what he is, other than the fact that he's big and has a lot of talent, has a really good arm, has twitchy movement, has a lot of traits, but, you know, we all talk about traits. I mean, I do it too, obviously, but it's the refinement of those traits. It's the ability to, to subtly execute them with all the necessary detail that's involved in playing the position. And that takes time. And, and Trey Lance is basically raw material at this point, more so than, than any of the others, it would seem. It was, is that one of the harder evaluations that you've done, Greg, just because of the circumstances? Well, the, the evaluation of the tape, it doesn't make it any harder. It's There's no way to know how essentially taking a full year off impacts a player other than it's not a good thing, yeah. but you don't know exactly you know, how it will impact him. But he does have traits, and I even made the point in my evalu on my evaluation sheet um, that it wouldn't surprise me if three years down the road we're talking about him as a really good NFL quarterback. For sure. And, and, you know, Niners fans, not Niners fans don't care about any of that. They just saw the 80 yard pass. They're like, I want that guy. I know what Jimmy right, Garoppolo okay. is. Right. And of course we saw that over and over on the highlights yeah. and it was, you know, it, it was design movement to his left, throwing the ball back to his right. And he had to throw it a good distance. So you saw the arm. So it was a spectacular play. And that's what people are responding to. Yeah, indeed. So let's talk about what Titans fans were responding to based off of pro Friday's preseason game against the Atlanta Falcons. Um, you know, start to finish, it was, as all preseason games are, very basic. And outside of Dean Pease, really coming after Logan Woodside. I know you probably didn't watch anything, but the two players we're going to talk about, Dylan Raines and Rashad Weaver, but in Mike Vrabel's own words, Dean Pease was blitzing the shit out of Logan Woodside during the course of that preseason game. No, they came in. I mean, watch. obviously I watched because – Raiden's played through the end of the third quarter. So yes. I saw all of Woodside. I saw a decent amount of Matt Barkley. So, um, no, I, I saw, you know, th three full quarters of every single play. Sure. But the two players specifically that we would like to focus on are Raiden's and Rashad Weaver, the edge rusher out of pit. So starting with Raiden's, because that is the player who is who 
you know, most had the opportunity to claim a starting role in this offense and seemed to be a little further away for the same reasons that we're talking about Trey Lance. He just hasn't played a ton of football in the last two years. So they started him for the first two series inside, played guard. They've been working him at guard and tackle throughout the course of training camp. That He gave up a, he gave up a sack at guard uh, in one of the series. It was not an over. Like uh, he didn't get- but it wasn't really on him. Well, go ahead. Yeah, no, that, that sack wasn't really on him. Because uh, the ball was held, and you know, we look, people have to understand when you call a play and a protection, the protection is designed for a certain amount of time based on the play call. And if the protection goes beyond, or if or if the quarterback is in the the pocket for longer than the design and structure of the play, then it's really not on the offensive line. No, and that's fantastic context because, of course, people immediately gravitate, uh, you know, whether it be a social media or otherwise, to Dylan Radens gave up a sack because you saw the player who was in front of him make the play that, uh, well, that the, on the Logan classic Woodside. case, and, and it's not Titans related, but the classic example of that goes back years and years. And my good buddy Mike Tannenbaum will remember this when the Jets drafted Vernon Goldston with the sixth overall pick in the draft. And obviously he didn't make it, but everybody spoke about the great game he had against Jake Long from Michigan. And Long yeah. was, I believe, the first player chosen, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken. In that draft, and, yeah. Yeah. And two of them were three-step. Two of the sacks Goldson had were three-step drops by the quarterback in which the quarterback held the ball. And Long actually did his job with the kind of block that he made on a three-step drop. But the quarterback held the ball. The ball's in a three-step drop, the ball's supposed to be out in 1.5 seconds. And if the ball's not out in 1.5 seconds, the responsibility is removed from the offensive lineman. And then Goldston sacked uh, the quarterback. I can't remember who the quarterback was, sacked him twice. And it was, you know, probably three or four seconds into the play. And people were saying, oh, he beat Jake Long. No, he didn't beat Jake Long. So, uh, you know, I'm just trying to give some context about the sack that Raidens did not give up. Well, and that's, listen, that's why people listen to the podcast because my, an untrained eye like myself, Greg, I'm looking at that as, okay, I'm not necessarily understand. I know, I know the three-step drop. I know the five-step drop. I know the seven-step drop, right? But I'm not necessarily, we're not, we're not keen to what is being asked of the offensive linemen specifically. We're just watching the play itself and the result of the play. But Raiden's at guard, and we've talked with you previously about how you thought he may be suited better on the inside. We talked even about right. the setter position, but I thought, I, I thought what we saw from him at guard was fine. And then what I saw from him at tackle throughout the course of that, understanding the level of competition, I thought he held up really well. I mean, just looking at him. Okay. Yeah. Obviously we know he's not playing against the number ones and, but just watching him, I thought he played well. Now I can't imagine he's going to be a starter at guard. They have Nick Davis at right guard and staff called a left guard. I, they're the starters, I, you Correct. know, barring any, barring an injury. So he's not going to beat out either one of those guys. So essentially I think he was drafted to play right tackle because they lost Dennis Kelly. I mean, I know they still have Quisenberry. I know they still have some but I think he was ultimately drafted to play right tackle. And he started the third series at right tackle. I thought he played well. Um, I thought as a run blocker, they asked him to do a number of things. He had to make some drive and base blocks where it, where it was play side and he had to come off the ball with some leverage and power. I thought he showed some sustainability doing that. The other thing is, is they're a predominant zone run team. So he, when the run is away from him, he has to work to the second level very often. And I thought he showed good, good athleticism and mobility. Those are very difficult blocks, Buck, when you have to block a moving linebacker who's a better athlete than you are, and you have to try to at least get a body on him with balance and body control. You know, those are hard blocks. The guy's a better athlete than you are but I thought he, he did a good job. Um, there was only one play where I thought he did not execute his assignment. There was a, a one yard loss by Sargent um, in the second quarter. And that was in my view, based on tape study, I thought that was Raiden's responsibility. Um, he did not execute his blocking assignment. He had the play side stacked backer and he went to the defensive end who I believe uh, the, the tight end was responsible for the defensive end. And, but he went to the, um, uh, he went to the defensive end instead of the stack backer. And then you, you talk about uh, his pass protection. I thought he showed good knee bend, good balance in both his 45 degree and vertical pass sets. He was efficient with his kick slides. His base was firm. His hands were in good position to strike. 
I, I thought just, as I said, studying him and looking at the technique, putting aside who he's playing against, uh, because you have to start somewhere, Buck. That's the thing. Absolutely. You know, when he gets graded, and I don't know who the offensive line coach is. You do, I'm sure. I don't know who it is. Keith um, Carter, formerly of the Falcons, ironically enough. Okay, Keith Carter. He's not going to say to Dylan Radens, he's not going to say, you know, oh, you were playing against, you know, a guy who's not a starter. He's not going to say that. He's going to evaluate how Dylan Radens played. And that's, and, that's been, trying, and that's what I'm trying to do. And I thought Dylan Radens played well. And that's been the focal point with, with Vrabel and with Keith Carter and Mike Sullivan, who's the assistant offensive line coaches. They've just been trying to get him to not overthink his technique. So when you, right. you lay it out like that, that's exactly what they're going to be breaking down yeah. in their coaches' meetings and then their position meetings after the fact evaluating his technique against the competition that was his, that was his facing. Yeah. Cause it's the, all they can do at this point. Look, Dylan Raiden's was a high pick. Okay. Most people agreed that he should have been a high pick based on his college tape and his traits. So they know he's got the traits to play in the league. So they're not evaluating him based on his opponent. They're evaluating him based on the execution of those traits based on the play call. Hey, zone run play. How did he execute his traits on the zone run play? His traits and his technique. That's a very important point. I should always mention technique with an alignment, but that's what they're evaluating, Buck. They're not evaluating him based on who he's playing against. They're evaluating him. They're isolating his traits and technique, and that's what they'll work on now this week. You, you know, they'll work on those specific things when they do the individual drills. I was I was laughing listening to 3HL, which of course uh, Greg makes an appearance on each and every Thursday on 104.5 The Zone. Coach Mack was doing his uh, his post preseason game uh, hit with them as well, Greg, and he got a piece of Don Davenport because Don was dismissing the level of competition and That's, he laid it laid it out for her, her exactly the same way you just did. It's not relevant. I mean, you know, when I say it's not relevant for a rookie, it's not relevant because a rookie you're trying to get to play to a high level snap after snap after snap with proper execution. That's what you're trying to do. And particularly with a high pick who's got the talent and the physical and athletic traits, if he can do that, then you know he'll be able to function in this league. But that's that's what you're looking at. We know, you know, you could say that about anybody. Then why even bother in the preseason? You know, because obviously you, you're going to get a lot of guys not playing against the ones. I mean, a lot of ones didn't play this week. Whether they play this week, I mean, what's the Titans plan this week? Do you know? They're not going to be a one out on the field, Greg. They're not. I mean, AJ Brown and Julio Jones for you know, Julio's a different situation, right? But right. a lot of these dudes aren't even out here for the practices against the Bucks, and obviously, that's when you yeah. would want to see the ones in the work that they're getting. Yeah, I mean, Tannehill's not going this week, right? No, 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 no. no. So he's not going to go week three either. No, so, <laughs> no. So I mean, you know, you, you you can't. You still have to evaluate players. So, and I'm glad to hear Coach Max said the same thing. Look, he's, he knows more about it than I do. He's a coach. But, but that's what you do. You're evaluating the player. Who he's playing against is, is not necessarily relevant to how you go about teaching him and working with him to get better. Oh, uh, Greg, you know this as well as I do. You're going to have to tell people this every year because every year we have reactions off the preseason and the conversation oh, we continues. We, hey, the, good, the good fight continues, Greg. It's, it's okay. Good. <laughs> hey, it's good for all of us, Buck. You know, people are excited about football. Football's back. You know, that's all that matters right now. Indeed. So let's put a bow on this particular football conversation with Rashad Weaver. He was, you know, arguably yep. the, the story of that preseason game for a team that so desperately needs pass rush and has worked to retool this defense. The stat line is what it is. The sack and a half that he's credited for. You saw the pass break up and tackles for loss, things of this nature. What did the tape show? Well, what the tape showed to me, and I think this is a positive, is he looked very much like he did at Pitt because he's a player He's not a quickness explosion player. He's not a bender. He's not flexible. He's not purely explosive. What he is, is he's a player with strong, heavy hands and natural power. That's how he played at Pitt. That's how we looked in this preseason game. Um, and what was really interesting to me is he, I think he played 41 snaps and mm -hmm. uh, and there were snaps in which they moved him inside, by the way, in the sub nickel front. And I think that'll be interesting to see if they do that 
assuming he makes the team uh, and if he becomes part of the rotation when the regular season starts, if they do that and they move him inside. But putting aside those plays, and there might have been 10 or 12 of those, um, the rest of the plays except one, he always lined up to the boundary side of the formation, the short side of the field. And that's interesting. And the reason that's interesting is because when he was in the base defense, meaning a 5-2 or a 3-4, whatever people want to call it, it's essentially a 5-2 front because there's five players on the ball and two stack backers. But the reason that's important is when you're playing to the boundary as the outside line of scrimmage player on the ball, then you're the edge setter in the run game because the corner can't be because the corner has got to run with the receiver. If the receiver runs vertically on the boundary side of the field, the corner has got to run with him. So he's the edge setter in the run game. And that's, that's a big responsibility because you can't let anyone get outside of you. But I thought he looked very much like he did in college. You saw the heavy hands, you saw the power. Um, and, and that's what he is. He's an on the ball player. We might have spoken about this. He's, he was not going to be a stack backer. He's right. going to play on the ball. Yeah, and and the, you're speaking to your earlier point about the snaps that he did play inside the, the dozen or, or less than a dozen that he played inside. That's something that Mike Vrabel and John Robinson worked with him on at the Senior Bowl to see if he was willing to get inside and play across the front as they may look at. Yeah, I think he can do it. Try to get versatile. I think he can do. It. He plays off contact well. Um, I think he could be effective in the stunt game. Now, in the stunt game, there's a picker, and he's the guy who goes first. And then there's the looper, the guy who loops around. To me, he'd be more effective as the picker, the guy who goes first, because that's where his power shows up. The looper has to have more flexibility to his core and his body. And Weaver's not that guy, in my yeah. view, anyway. Yeah, well, he will He will certainly, without the starters on the field on Saturday against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I'm certain that he will be a focal point again against this Bucks team. Greg, uh, appreciate the time as always for the audience out there. Make Greg happy. Leave us a, a five-star rating in Apple Podcast. <laughs> Subscribe, rate, review. You know Greg is checking the Apple Podcast reviews every night. Make this man happy. Yeah, I feel like an Uber driver getting my review, you know? That's, listen, <laughs> absolutely. Uber drivers and podcasters. Greg. Right, right, right. We all need reviews. Thanks for hanging out on this episode of The Install. We'll talk to you again next week, and the tape study will continue. Greg, it's a pleasure as always. Thanks, Buck.